monetary union. This is a programme about a single European currency. It's not about sovereignty or the social chapter or rebellious Eurosceptics, important as those subjects are. It's about the economic arguments for and against monetary union, arguments about jobs, trade, savings and living standards. These arguments are not often soberly made, and yet we may find that a balance sheet of the economic pros and cons would prove decisive. But can it be done, and can we really separate the economics from the politics? John Stevens, Conservative Foreign Affairs spokesman in the European Parliament, is in no doubt. For him, there's a straightforward case. It's about Europe's economic survival. We face a huge competitive challenge from the emerging economies, particularly the Far East. And unless we have very radical change in the structure of the European economy, we're going to be in very serious trouble. And I regard the principal argument in favour of monetary union is forcing that process of change in two ways. Firstly, in completing the single market. We need an additional pressure to genuinely create a single economic space with the economies of scale that go with that. And that, in my view, demands a single currency. The second element is how to force flexibility in our economy, particularly in labour markets. Many people who criticise monetary union point out that it would be a very rough ride for areas that have sub-average labour productivity. But it's precisely that rough ride that we need to bring home to our populations that unless we get ourselves competitive, there is no hope for our being able to maintain, let alone increase, our relative standard of living in the future. According to this view, Europe would also benefit from having a world-class currency. Norbert Walter is chief economist at Deutsche Bank. I'm pretty sure the single currency has something to offer in the importance of European currencies on a world scale. Any one of the European currencies today, even the Deutsche Mark, is not really important as a reserve currency for anybody else. If, however, there would be one European currency, or a European currency of at least a number of important countries, such a currency, if it is stable and credible, could develop into a real competitor to the United States dollar. But probably the strongest economic argument for a single currency turns on the overall benefits we could draw from lower interest rates. That should lead to a more efficient economic environment, and that in turn should generate more confidence, more investment and more jobs. Charles Goodhart is Professor of Economics at the London School of Economics. The main benefit is getting rid of the uncertainties of whether uh, the currencies might devalue in practice against the Deutsche Mark, which tends to keep their interest rate a lot higher than they otherwise would be. For example, the French interest rate is something of the order, I think, of almost 100 basis points higher than the German at the moment, even though the French inflation rate is actually lower. And, of course, the margin is far greater for currencies such as the lira. Now, if we all had interest rates that were as low as existed in Germany, which one would, ex in fact, expect to be the case under EMU, then this would provide a considerable benefit over the long term in higher investment, possibly the most important, though impossible to quantify, is the possibility that a single currency would provide the basis for a much enhanced degree of competition within the single market and really tie the economies together, which could provide economies of scope and scale to an extent that is not presently available. So one might be able to see faster growth from that particular source. In fact, real interest rates in the UK are currently nearly half a percent higher than those in Germany. The successful scenario outlined by Charles Goodhart would very much depend on the fate of the single European market, the largest free trade area in the world. The overwhelming majority of businesses believe that it offers valuable commercial opportunities. But for the supporters of a single currency, the future of the single market cannot be taken for granted. They fear that competitive devaluations of national currencies will trigger calls for new trade barriers and argue that monetary union is an essential condition of the single market's long-term survival. Graham Bishop is European advisor at Salomon Brothers. I believe that a single currency is indispensable for a robust and durable single market. That is, in my view, the primary economic rationale for having monetary union. I always use the example of fish after the sterling ERM departure. 
the French fishermen suddenly see that British fish landed in France is 20% cheaper and they reacted very violently, very forcibly and the French government responded to their concerns. And that's a simple illustration of unfair competition as seen by the other party from a sudden competitive depreciation. Yes, it constitutes an infringement of the single market, but the temptation will be enormous. And I would cite Philippe Maistat, the finance minister of Belgium, who said very clearly that if the countries in monetary union find themselves overwhelmed by a wave of competitiveness from depreciating countries, they will have to consider matching the single market to the single currency. Very clear threat. Just how genuine that threat is must be open to question. Certainly there have been voices in some of Europe's more protectionist capitals criticizing Britain and Italy, both now outside the exchange rate mechanism, for undercutting their EU partners and enjoying the benefits of the single market. But most players, including Germany and the European Commission, have ruled out retaliatory measures. The likeliest forms of revenge are petty measures to obstruct trade, as when the French authorities insisted on routing all Japanese video recorders through Poitiers, ostensibly for, wait for it, customs purposes. Probably the least contested of the arguments for a single currency are the cost savings. Travellers, holiday makers and businesses would all save money by not having to switch between currencies. Most businesses see potential advantages in a single currency and are keen that we keep our options open. Enthusiasm is greater among large firms than among smaller companies, probably because small firms do less business with Europe. But even for small businesses, the present system of fluctuating exchange rates brings costs and uncertainty. For Tony Shepard, the chairman of a small group of engineering firms near Bristol, the single market is not enough. We're disadvantaged in the present situation by having to deal in a large number of currencies. We need to purchase the best components for our systems and at present we're buying valves from Italy, we're buying turbine meters from France, ultrasonic equipment from Holland, measurement instruments from Germany. Each one of these involves a currency transaction. Companies such as ours have to bid for a contract a good time before they actually get the job. That means that we have to collect our price information maybe three or four months before we're awarded the contract. That means that we have to get our prices in, in five or six different currencies, assume that they are going to remain the same when we actually get the contract. Quite often that doesn't happen and we immediately have a risk which we can't insure against. It costs up to 3% of the value of any particular currency transaction to insure it. If you only get one in four, you're talking about 12%, and that is more than our profit margin. Would you care to speculate at all about what your own business might need to do if uh, Britain stayed outside a single currency? Obviously, it's a pretty extreme situation, and I think that the first thing, of course, would be that we would try to deal in the common currency. And the second reaction, of course, would be that we have to be where our customers are, and if our customers move out, we had to follow. So now we've heard the main arguments for the single currency. At first sight, the case seems quite compelling. Interestingly, many of these arguments are not really disputed by the sceptics, who base their case on other grounds, one of which is that Europe's economies are not sufficiently alike. There's general agreement that a single currency area is most likely to work if the participating countries have broadly similar economies, what economists call an optimal currency area, like the Benelux countries. A single currency area should ideally also be flexible enough to respond to economic shocks which affect some countries but not others. Warwick Lightfoot is Treasury Economist at the Royal Bank of Scotland. So how does the European Union measure up? The criteria that they use to judge that are, are the economies integrated? Are they similar economies? Is there a high degree of labour and capital mobility within them? Do they respond in a similar way to economic shocks? Do they respond in a similar way to macroeconomic policy instruments like interest rates? And can they adjust swiftly and easily both to adverse economic shocks and to beneficial uh, shocks or opportunities? Now, if you work through those criteria, I think you will have serious grounds for doubting whether the countries that signed the Maastricht Treaty constitute an optimal currency area. First of all, the cultural and political differences and the differences in business culture, not least language of course, makes the limitations in practice on capital and uh, labour mobility. On the question of whether the countries concerned have economies that are similar, alternatively respond in a similar way to interest rates, I think there are substantial differences. The economies are composed of different financial and uh, manufacturing sectors that vary in their size. 
Manufacturing is very important in Germany. It's less important in the United Kingdom. In the United Kingdom, financial services and the media sector is much more important than it is amongst our, our continental neighbours. So you, a shock to those sectors would have an impact on the United Kingdom that wouldn't happen among our European neighbours and so the monetary policy that would be appropriate for them would not be appropriate for us. By shocks, Warwick Lightfoot means unforeseen events like sudden rises in the oil price, a slump in consumer demand for a product or savage price undercutting by a commercial rival. The crucial point is that with a single currency, a country will no longer have the option of devaluing its currency to save jobs by selling its goods and services more cheaply abroad. So what other options are available for sorting out a crisis? A national government can normally borrow money on the markets. If it behaves responsibly, the markets will be quite happy to lend to it, as they did to the German government to help pay for reunification. But under a single currency, things won't be so simple. Government's ability to borrow will be limited by the Maastricht requirement that the annual public deficit should not exceed 3% of gross domestic product. The point is that shocks produce unemployment. So how would people adjust? Charles Goodhart of the LSE. Such adjustments can take two main forms. The first form is adjustment in the level of wages, wage flexibility. And the second form, which is just as important, is adjustment through labour mobility, so that workers who are in the less advantageous areas simply move to the more advantageous areas. And if one is comparing the United States again, the difference between the US and Europe is not actually so much in greater wage flexibility in the US, though that does exist, but in the fact that labour mobility between states is far greater than it is within a nation state within Europe. The Americans, if they find that they lose a job in California, get into their mobile homes and simply drive to Minnesota or Arkansas or wherever. And they do that in really quite large numbers. That is not true even within a single nation state like the UK or Italy. As for inter-nation mobility, there's all the problems of language and culture and so on. And indeed, I think that uh, the European Union would find fairly considerable political pressures if there was to be sufficient labour mobility to deal with the economic problems. So that in a sense, there's a greater problem within Europe, because either there is quite likely to be economic difficulties if there's low labour mobility, or social difficulties if there's high labour mobility. It's unlikely that Europe would see long convoys of the unemployed streaming out of its depressed regions, like the hardy pioneers of a Steinbeck novel. By the same token, we are generally unwilling to take pay cuts to stay competitive in a crisis. The option of bailing out countries in difficulty is explicitly ruled out by the Maastricht Treaty. But pressure could easily grow for some central mechanism for dealing with emergencies. The resources presently available to Brussels are actually very small, just 1.2% of member states' GDP. Compare that with a 40 to 45% of GDP which passes through the hands of most European governments. So no one under the present system could expect to get much out of Brussels. Nor are British, German and Dutch taxpayers keen to pick up the tab for poor workers in Portugal or Greece. But could something else be put in place? John Arrowsmith, a senior research fellow at the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. In his previous job at the Bank of England, he was closely involved in work on the Maastricht Treaty. Once the union is formed, should a, a major shock with continuing repercussions occur, if it is of potential magnitude that the country cannot realistically cope with it on its own, I think there must be a duty upon the union as a whole and its individual members to provide some form of assistance. Uh, if it's foreseen that that shock will in due course die down, I think a case can be made for some sort of recycling facility. In other words, assistance can be provided on a temporary basis, even over the medium term, on the understanding that it is eventually repaid. That kind of facility could then be recycled to another country facing a different shock at another time. It's possible to envisage that being financed either from the community budget, although there's no provision for that uh, at present, or it could be financed by community borrowing on the markets.
that is not very different from the facility that exists at present, which is known as the Community Loan Mechanism, which was designed to provide balance of payments assistance in the medium term to countries who are encountering difficulties. But would there be the political will to create such a mechanism? The richer countries won't want to pay for it. And why should less responsible countries bother to behave if they can be saved from the consequences of their own actions? And yet, such a mechanism is probably essential. Otherwise, our best hope is that in practice, the most serious shocks affecting the member states would affect everyone and would require collective action. So even though we have identified real cost savings from a single currency and a potential boost to investment, growth and Europe's economic clout in the world, we already find that our judgments about the long-term success of a single currency are heavily dependent on the political willingness to address or ride out the problems which are bound to arise on the way. But would all countries have to face these problems, or are there features of Britain which might make us different? Ruth Lee is Head of Policy at the Institute of Directors. There are certain problems about the British economy, or certain factors of the British economy, that are different from the more closely integrated economies on the continental Europe. I think the first one is that our trade is much more diverse. In other words, if we were in the single currency and the single currency moves say, against the dollar, then the impact on our economy would be greater than it would be, say, on the more insulated German economy or the Benelux economies. The second thing I would say is that in terms of economic cycles, we tend to run ahead of the rest of continental Europe. This means that perhaps an interest rate that would be suitable for, say, Germany, if it were in a single currency, would be different from the one that Britain would need. That would lead to problems if we were in a single currency. And I think the third difference, and perhaps this is the most vital difference of all, is that a lot more of our borrowing is at the so-called short end. In other words, it's, on, it's linked to base rates. The short end rates Ruth Lee is talking about are the rates which help set our mortgages. But under a single currency, we could expect a new range of financial products, the bulk of which would be at fixed interest rates, as they are on the continent. Some Eurosceptics also worry that we could jeopardise our competitiveness by being part of a high-cost, over-regulated, protectionist Europe. But this is guilt by association. There is nothing in the single currency which implies a threat to these advantages. Our trading and investment patterns are certainly different from those of our partners. We are rather less dependent on EU trade, and the cost savings would be correspondingly smaller. And if Ruth Lee is right about the depth of those differences, it's important that we should have the right monetary policy for our needs. But are we able to choose that policy for ourselves? Ruth Lee believes that, under the present system, we can. There's no doubt that Britain still has a degree of monetary sovereignty, and it's quite wrong for people to say that we don't. And there's an extremely good example of this. When we were in the exchange rate mechanism between 1990 and 1992, we actually didn't really have any. If the Bundesbank changed its interest rates, then pretty well we had to change them as well. And of course, uh, France isn't still in that position now, and all the other countries that are still linked to the Deutschmark. But look what happened uh, after Black Wednesday, which was the 16th of September 1992, when the pound actually left the exchange rate mechanism. What then happened to our interest rates? Were they tied to Germany's rate? Of course they weren't. And the base rate actually fell from 10% in the middle of September down to 6% by the beginning of 1993. Now, if that's not a degree of monetary sovereignty, I don't know what is. But the French want a single currency in order to regain control of their monetary policy. They're tired of seeing the Bundesbank and the Deutschmark call the shots. With the European Central Bank, the argument goes, the Germans would only have one seat at the table. For John Arrowsmith, just because a nation-state is making sovereign decisions, it doesn't mean that others are not dictating its range of options. We would not have complete independence of monetary policy. We do not at present, even though our exchange rate is floating against the countries who are in the exchange rate mechanism. Our monetary policy is at present dominated by Germany. There is a strong likelihood that our exchange rate and hence our monetary policies would be even more dominated by a coherent group of countries within a monetary union. So on the monetary front, I don't think we would be at any greater advantage outside the Union than we would be within it. We would also, I think, be more vulnerable to market reactions and capital movements. If you can envisage a large single currency block with sterling floating alongside it, the potential for capital movements into and especially out of sterling 
given the existence of that block, would, I think, be even greater than the present potential for capital movements between the different member states of the European community. There are other factors for Britain to weigh, including the potential implications for the City of London if we stay out of a single currency, and for inward investment into Britain from countries like Japan, Korea and the USA. Evaluating those factors isn't easy. We know that we have strengths which should help safeguard our position, irrespective of whether we join a single currency. The fact that sterling is not one of the leading international reserve currencies did not stop the City of London from becoming the centre of the lucrative dollar market in Europe. Foreign banks, including German banks, are beating a path to London. Few observers are sounding alarm bells for the medium term. But what about the longer term? Charles Goodhart. With the European Central Bank to be sited at Frankfurt and the money markets probably established primarily in Frankfurt and Paris, it seems improbable that the ECB would undertake its foreign exchange activities through a center which was not even party to that same single currency. And I would expect that slowly, but I think inevitably, if we were not part of EMU, we would lose share of major European markets. Even outside the single currency, Britain should retain strong attractions for overseas investors. Few strikes, reasonable labour costs, the lowest business taxes in the EU, and of course the English language. Add to that the attraction, under the present regime, of a competitive currency. But should we plan on such assumptions? Most foreign investors are not interested in the details of European integration, but they have an overall sense of something important going on in Europe. Japanese businessmen don't conceal their concern about seeing Britain outside that process, especially if any question mark appeared over our access to the single market. Graham Bishop is uneasy about the implications of staying outside the single currency. If we do that, then many of our partners will see this as a fundamental parting of the ways. And we have, over the past decade or so, had an inflow of, I think it's about 600,000 new jobs from inward investment. Would those companies look at Britain as the right site for their European investment? The evidence that I've heard so far is that they would have substantial second thoughts about it. They wouldn't necessarily take away the plants they have at the moment, but where would the new plants go? And in 10 years' time, what would be the consequence? That's inward investment. Uh, say from countries like Japan, where we've seen Japanese uh, companies, Nissan, Honda, Toyota and so on, making such large investments in the UK. We now produce more cars in the UK than we ever have done before. So this is a very powerful industrial influence. Will it continue? I suspect the Japanese felt that there was going to be any sign of covert protectionism. And I pointed out earlier the risks of the, to the single market of competitive depreciations and the idea that over a period you would see covert protectionism creeping in. They would have very substantial second thoughts about continuing their investment program here. The scenario Gray and Bishop sketches could be an uncomfortable one for Britain. It reminds us that the move to a single currency could divide the European Union in a way never seen since its foundation in 1957. There would be five categories. Those countries which join the single currency, those like Denmark who don't want to, those, like Italy and Belgium, who would like to, but probably can't at the outset. Those, like Britain, who could, but may not wish to. And those whose main ambition is simply to join the European Union. The financial markets are unlikely to be impressed by such divisions opening up in Europe. But for Yves Thibault de Silgi, the European Commissioner responsible for EMU, these divisions can be overcome. We have to avoid to divide the Europe in two parts. So we have in the same time to, to find the mechanism to be sure the single market and the cohesion on the U Europe will continue. So for me, they will not have uh, the in and the outs, but uh, probably the in and the nearly ins, because we'll have a dynamism. And all the member states has to be a member of the, of the EMU at, at a moment, at another moment, and uh, all the member states have the vocation to participate in the new system. At present in the European community, we have 15 member states 
with one member state being dominant economically and in terms of monetary policy, namely Germany. In a two-tier monetary union, we would find that the community was dominated not by just one country, but by all the countries in the monetary union. John Arrowsmith of the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. There's a danger that the asymmetry that already exists to some extent within the community would be reinforced and quite markedly reinforced in that the countries outside the monetary union would tend to be a fairly disparate group. The impression that there was a, a rich and well-ordered core in the monetary union and a poorer and perhaps rather more feckless group of countries outside the union would, I think, be seized upon by the financial markets. And there must be a risk that the circumstances of those who are outside the union would markedly deteriorate by the mere fact of a monetary union being formed. So how does our balance sheet look so far? We have seen that there are quite strong economic arguments for a single currency and significant risks in Britain standing aside. But given the likelihood of shocks, the key question is whether the benefits will be sustainable, both economically and politically. The Germans want to be sure that the new currency will be as hard and inflation-proof as the Deutschmark. They have already reserved themselves the right to decide which countries meet the convergence criteria in order to join, and now they want a progressive tightening of the rules for participating countries, with sanctions to punish fiscally irresponsible countries. This is being fiercely resisted by those like the French, who most want EMU to happen. This is not just a technical disagreement. There is growing unease about public accountability and where the political buck would stop in the so-called Bankers Europe. Chancellor Kohl and the Bundesbank believe that legitimacy and public support can only be secured within a real political union in Europe, a view shared by many British supporters of EMU. Others argue that it is only the nation state which can bring legitimacy and accountability to economic policy. Tim Congdon is economic advisor to the Gerarda National Group, a one of the Chancellor's panel of six wise men. Within the various nation states, everybody is accountable in some sense, and their democracies and ultimately there's accountability to the people. Now Europe has a parliament, but there's not much interest in it in most of the electorates across Europe, and its powers are rather unclear, so there is this problem with all of the European Union institutions of a democratic deficit. Now, in the case of the central bank, or the proposed European central bank, this problem is particularly severe. And I think there will be many doubts about the acceptability of decisions taken by European central bank, which overrode the wishes and desires of national governments. And this is all tied up with the question of the impossibility I think impossibility is the right word, of having a monetary union without a political union. Most supporters of a single currency would probably agree with that. But some of its advocates believe that the politicians and the bankers should and do have clearly defined and separate roles. So Leon Britton is vice president of the European Commission. The convergence criteria have established what is necessary in order to get EMU going. And let's not forget that those convergence criteria weren't something that were invented by politicians. Well, the history of it, of course, is that a group consisting essentially of central bankers were asked the question, not should there be a, a single currency and an economic and monetary union, but if the politicians want to have one, what are the conditions that have to be met which would enable it to work? And they came up with the answer, which is that the convergence criteria would have to be met, and those were then incorporated in the treaty. Now, beyond that, on the economic as opposed to the monetary side, the conditions are very simple. I mean, you obviously uh, can't expect one country to bail out another country if it chooses to have a, a huge budget deficit. But beyond that, the composition as between taxation and expenditure, as between different types of expenditure and different types of taxation, all those fundamental decisions on fiscal policy will remain matters for national governments. But the practice may be rather different. The new bank could be drawn into politics and find itself making political judgments. For Dan Corey, senior economist at the Left of Centre Institute of Public Policy Research, that is to be welcomed. My reading of history on the whole 
is that it's very rarely that we set up a body with power with the democratic structure we would like right from the beginning. What tends to happen is power moves somewhere for some reason. And uh, as people realize that's where the action is, the democratic structures start to emerge to give some accountability. And I think as long as the Maastricht Treaty and the reality of European politics hasn't completely closed that off, I think that's what will emerge. And although the European Bank will always remain independent in the sense of deciding when and how to raise European interest rates, it will become part of the usual scene where it is influenced by democratic pressures, it is trying to coordinate one way or the other with fiscal policy and so on. It's hard to imagine democratic politicians not wanting to influence such a key instrument of power, just as it's hard to imagine bankers cocooning themselves completely from public opinion. And if we look at past models of fixed exchange rates, we discover that these did show some margin of manoeuvre. Keith Middlemass, Professor of Contemporary History at Sussex University, is more uneasy about the effects of political influence. If you look back even at the old gold standard, the way it operated in the late 19th century and, and down to 1914, it was always believed to be an automatic system, and central bankers at the time rather fostered that. But historians since have realized that there were a lot of nudges and winks and pushes to it. There was an element of management about it. And I think that would be true under EMU. Nothing is truly independent. There is no central bank in the world which is totally independent of the political system. It's actually inconceivable that it should be so because the job of a central bank is to be an arm of the state. Some will find the idea of those nudges and pushes reassuring, others alarming, because their judgment of the economic case for EMU depends on the extent to which the new currency is free from political influence. And there's another point. Cynics often underestimate the importance of solidarity within the European Union. That solidarity is likely to be particularly strong amongst the founding members of the community. If a country like Italy or Belgium did not bring its national debt more within the accepted margins, then it could conceivably pose strains. And there would be a sort of informal leverage here. Well, yes, we will try to do this, but you realize there are political difficulties, huge threats to the government's future and so on. You have to give us help. All I'm saying is that within a collective like this, where the member states are of different size and different degrees of power and frequently different economic development, there are going to be a lot of considerations which you can't put down in figures and on paper. And they will weigh when crises cause everybody to try to restore equilibrium and the rules alone are unlikely to do it. We can't tell what sort of solution would be put together. John Arrowsmith's idea of a time-limited borrowing facility to cover emergencies would be one possibility. But Ruth Lee of the Institute of Directors fears the siren voices calling for something more than a monetary union. If for some reason the various economies within Europe got out of kilter, then I think there start to be great political pressures for offsetting fiscal policy. Obviously a country in trouble can't do anything about its interest rates, it can't do anything unilaterally about the exchange rate. So what's the other tool? The other tool is fiscal policy. And if, as I say, there were great pressures and great problems with certain countries, I think you'd find that those particular countries would start saying, look, we do need some sort of common fiscal policy. So there can be something that can be there if to offset the problems that a common monetary policy is causing. This would make it much harder to predict or to evaluate what kind of economics would be practiced under a single currency. But how likely is this scenario? After all, there is now growing political agreement across the world on the principle of sound money. Britain has paid a high price for decades of irresponsible stop-go policies. Governments have played fast and loose with inflation and the exchange rate to curry favor with the voters. Forty years ago, the pound bought 13 Deutschmarks. Now it buys just over two. But some lessons have been learned, and it's now less clear that Britain needs a single currency just to put our own house in order. Sir Peter Petrie is European advisor to the Governor of the Bank of England. Undoubtedly, the problem we've had during the 60s and 70s and the second half of the 80s has been this inability to deliver non-inflationary sustainable growth. The question is whether we can do so now. The omens, I would say, are good. Governor Eddie George uh, has been heard to say that he's never known a time when the prospects were better of our being able to achieve that.
On what basis does one make that rather optimistic judgment on the basis of the figures as they are now, but also on the procedures? There has been a change in the greater transparency and openness of the way in which monetary policy is conducted. And that is something which has, I think, and certainly should create greater confidence in the markets and greater possibility, therefore, of long-term sustainable economic growth. The growth of a consensus around sound money has more or less foreclosed the option of paying for expansionary policies by devaluing the currency. The left in particular has lost a familiar tool of economic management, one it could never regain under a single currency. But Dan Corey, for one, is bidding it good riddance. The main problem with a single currency from the left's perspective has been that it takes away the power to de devalue in particular, and there's a long tradition on the left most recently encapsulated by Brian Gould that believed devaluation was a very important tool. If you care about employment and that's your number one goal, you're always anxious to not give away any tools that might help you increase levels of employment. There's two arguments really. One says that for various reasons Britain is incapable of controlling our costs. We always have inflation going up. Uh, wages uh, tend to be higher than that they should be. And the only way out of that situation to make sure we keep competitive is to keep the pound going down constantly, which is more or less what's happened. The other angle on that is that every now and then along comes what people call an economic shock a change in oil prices or a change in a world like German reunification, which you do need to adapt to. And one of the easiest ways to adapt your cost structure and so on is to devalue. So if you're worried about employment, you're worried about those things happening, you're lacking confidence that Britain can ever do anything about its uh, tendency to high inflation and high costs and so forth, then you want to hold on to devaluation. That is, of course, if you think devaluation works to actually get you anywhere. The most recent debate on the left would suggest that devaluation has been very much overrated. Uh, it's not an instrument that actually delivers you more jobs in the long run. For social democratic countries like Sweden, used to running expensive welfare programs, the Maastricht requirement tightly to control public borrowing in any one year and to limit the total amount of government debt to under 60% of GDP might seem like a discipline too far. Professor Lars Kalmfors is chairman of the Swedish Government Commission examining whether Sweden should join a single currency. We have been running a huge government budget deficit for some years and the public debt has increased uh, quite dramatically and for this reason I would say it, it does exist a consensus in Sweden that if we join or if we don't join the monetary union we still need to put our house in order uh, so it's a general consensus that we should meet the, these convergence criteria with respect to public debt and, and the budget deficit, irrespective of whether we join a monetary union or not. The problem is so serious, so we must deal with it anyway. So the political class is more or less agreed about the principles of economic management. But what about the voters? Would they really be prepared to let the bankers run Europe? John Stevens MEP thinks so. There's a lot of nonsense talked about democracy in relation to monetary policy. I mean, the fact of the matter is, until 1946, the notion of manipulating monetary policy for long-term political objectives was regarded as absolutely outrageous. A free society, it seems to me, is not just one which has democratic processes. It is also one which has entrenched a number of fundamental liberties of which the value of your property and the fact that you cannot be ripped off by your government inflating your savings down to nothing is a very important freedom alongside an independent judiciary and a free press. And I'm astonished that there is a whole body of journalistic opinion who are championing the idea of democracy when in fact I mean, the liberty of the press and an independent central bank and unimpeachable currency policy, those are all part of a free society. And the record of political interference in monetary policy has been catastrophic. If John Stevens is right, a policy trained on the defeat of inflation is potentially as popular in Britain and France as it is in Germany. Many people might prefer to be well-governed than self-governed. But if they are prepared to buy the project for the sake of their pensions and their savings, they need to be absolutely sure that the new bank will not be deflected from the pursuit of sound money by political considerations. No one will be as vigilant on that score as the financial markets. Their verdict on the new bank may well prove decisive.
Norbert Walter of Deutsche Bank accepts that credibility will have to be fought for. The European Central Bank certainly has not the credibility from birth. Some argue that the very fact that it has been decided that the European Central Bank should be at the location the Bundesbank is located, namely in Frankfurt, gives it, so to speak, an automatic credibility. I would not share that view. But the final test will, of course, come after the new currency is issued, and uh, international markets will test whether the credibility holds, even under pressure, and only after the European Central Bank has demonstrated, under pressure, that it performs the policies that have been announced, would there be international credibility. I would argue it takes at least two years before the European currency is fully established internationally, before doubts have gone out of the markets, and I'm pretty sure that the European Central Bankers understand that and will act accordingly. That's the optimistic view. The practical problem of keeping the ship afloat could actually prove very tricky. The financial markets are not capricious. They do look closely at the economic fundamentals. But, like the voters, they are also swung by less tangible things like confidence, expectations and credibility. Warwick Lightfoot. A large part of the uh, weakness of the United States dollar against the yen last year seems to have come from the fact that people genuinely believed that the US Treasury was manipulating the dollar lower against the yen. And there's no real basis for that. But if we speak to the United States Treasury officials about it, or the Fed, there's no basis for that. But it does appear that the former US Treasury Secretary, Lloyd Benson, cracked what I think was genuinely a joke and conveyed the impression that that was what he would really like to see. Now, you imagine an arrangement where the European Union commits itself to coordinated intervention and one finance minister who does not like coordinated intervention decides to convey his thoughts to the market. It can make it very difficult to sustain the management of the European currency in the foreign exchange markets in those circumstances. And the other point I would make is that if you get a country taking part in the uh, Union that is not wholly committed to the creation of a single currency and is considering in its internal debate whether it wants to stay there. That can be an extremely destabilizing influence on the external value of the currency. In spite of the question mark over the timetable, it still seems likely that a single currency will go ahead. If Britain stays outside, the risks look considerable, even if we could just about live with it. We might cut a dash as a low-cost Hong Kong-type offshore economy, but that would largely depend on the success or failure of the single currency area itself. The economics of that area are probably viable in their own right, if there is enough economic convergence. Our balance sheet shows real potential benefits from a single currency, particularly for trade, investment and industrial efficiency. But the keys to the success of a single currency are ultimately human and political. They will lie in the hands of the bankers and politicians charged with running the currency, and all eyes will be on them. If Europe's leaders are to ride out the strains caused by the differences between Europe's economies, they will need to speak with one voice and show unflinching faith in the project. Once taken, the decision to join a single currency would be irrevocable. There are therefore three options in the event of serious economic problems. Full-scale political union, though that looks increasingly unlikely. A special loan facility with tough time limits to help countries in difficulty, but at the moment that would be fiercely resisted by the likely paymasters such as the Germans, or to tough it out and wait for the new currency to deliver the benefits it promises. That's probably the preferable option, but it may be too much to expect from politicians with one eye on the ballot box. This week's analysis, What Price Emu, was presented by Maurice Fraser and produced by Michael Glassland. The editor is Nicola Merrick.